of public lecture series of the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus, titled Traveling Archaeologies. It is my pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Effie Athanasopoulos, Associate Professor at the Department of Anthropology and the Department of Classics and Religious Studies of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln since 2006. Dr. Athanasopoulos received her doctoral title from the from the Department of Anthropology of the University of Pennsylvania in 1993, while she started her career as a teaching assistant at the same university in 1984. She also taught as a lecturer at Rutgers University in New Brunswick uh, and at the Department of Classical Studies of the University of Pennsylvania before she was appointed assistant professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in 1998. She has also been a fellow of the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln since 2019. Effie Athanasopoulos is a historical archaeologist with interests in landscape studies, social archaeology, medieval and post-medieval material culture, and the role of digital technologies in teaching and research. Her primary research interests are in Mediterranean archaeology. Effie has been carrying out fieldwork in southern Greece in the region of Nemea and is the author of the monograph Landscape Archaeology and the Medieval Countryside, Results of the Nemea Valley Archaeological Project, published in the American School of Classical Studies at Athens publication series in 2016. Currently, she is publishing the medieval deposits from the University of California Berkeley excavations at the Sanctuary of Zeus in, in Nemea. She has published widely on, Mediterranean, on, on medieval landscape archaeology, especially on the medieval countryside and Byzantine ceramics. She is a member of the managing committee of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens and serves on the advisory board of Hesperia. She is also the secretary of the Commission for Byzantine Archaeology of the International Association of Byzantine Studies. She serves on, on the board of several other professional organizations, and she's uh, vice president of the Archaeological Institute of America, Lincoln Omaha Society, which organizes educational lectures for the public. In addition, she's working with leg legacy data from excavations of historical sites in Nebraska and plans to make this material available via digital archive, a collaborative project with the Center for Digital Research in the Humanities at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. As a fellow of the center, she's involved in interdisciplinary initiatives in digital humanities, including a recent fund funded grant on machine learning and cultural heritage. <clears throat> Closing this introduction, I would like to kindly ask all our participants to keep their cameras off and their microphones muted. Should you wish to address a question or comment to our speaker, feel free to use the chat button on Zoom. You may also switch on your cameras after the end of the presentation to address your question directly to the speaker by raising your hand and unmuting your microphone. Dear Effie, we very much look forward to hearing all about the recent developments in landscape archaeology and settlement in southern Greece. Off to you. Well, thank you. I will start sharing my screen. <clears throat> I hope you can all see it. That's right. Yes, we can. That's the second slide, though. Oh, no. Um, it's gone now. I think Effie has just, um, by mistake, she has uh, logged out. Um, uh, she has terminated the connection, I think. So we will uh, wait for her for a few seconds. It can happen.
please bear with us. Um, We're still waiting for Effie to connect again. There she is. I'm sorry for the interruption. I think I pushed the wrong button and it all oh. went away. We're all here. So, so sorry. Thank you very much for your patience. I hope we're not going to have any more technical issues. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll um, start sharing my screen. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Effie. That's right. So thank you very much, Thanasi, for the invitation to present in the 59th public lecture series of the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus. Um, I'm really honored by this invitation and by the warm welcome to see so many friends, even though it's via Zoom. So this presentation examines the contribution of landscape archaeology to our understanding of the medieval period in Greece and the Aegean region especially the middle and late Byzantine period. So in the last 40 years, landscape archaeology projects have opened new paths and offered a new perspective on the study of the Greek landscape of all time periods from prehistory to the present. The focus here is the medieval past and landscape archaeology's contribution to the study of Byzantium. So traditionally, the archaeology of Byzantium has centered on major urban centers, centers, monuments, and standing architecture. Landscape archaeology has brought attention to the study of rural areas and provided a framework for the archaeological exploration of Byzantium's provinces. But first, what does the term landscape archaeology mean? So landscape is the backdrop for all archaeological work generally refers to both natural and cultural environments. Natural landscapes are unmodified, while cultural landscapes are constructed, modified by human societies. Landscape not only shapes, but is also shaped by human experience. So archaeology has dealt extensively with landscape and space, aspects emphasized in the approach known as settlement archaeology or settlement patterns, which emerged in the 1950s, it was defined as the study of societal relations using archaeological data. So this approach originated in the New World, and the seminal publication was Gordon Willey's report on prehistoric settlement patterns in the Viru Valley in Peru in 1953. And over time, settlement archaeology evolved into regional survey and eventually into landscape archaeology. Although regional survey or landscape archaeology developed in the Americas in the New World, this approach flourished in the Mediterranean starting in the 1950s with a survey of South Etruria in Italy. It was the first project to use surface survey as a tool for writing landscape history. It was undertaken by the British School at Rome and built on a long tradition of archaeological research in the region. It took place at a time when suburban growth and agricultural activity were bringing sites to the surface at an unprecedented rate. It started as a small scale field walking program and gradually increased in intensity. So over a period of 20 years, it served as a laboratory for the development of field survey methodology. And it produced a record of settlement and land use from prehistoric to medieval times. So the rapid adoption of this approach in the Mediterranean built upon the late 18th, early 19th century tradition of the European travelers especially the British topographers, who visited the classical lands with the text of Pausanias in hand and left very detailed narratives of their travels. 
For example, on behalf of the Society of Dilettanti, Richard Chandler visited the temple of Nemean Zeus in 1766 and provided the first substantial description of the site. So Chandler's description became a prototype for the many accounts of the area that were soon to follow. And the other depiction is by William Gell, which was published a bit later in 1810. A comparably pioneering project was the Minnesota Messinia expedition. So this regional survey started in the 1950s in Greece and continued until the mid 1970s. It served as a model for subsequent projects. The early surveys such as MME focused on particular chronological periods, primarily the Bronze Age, and implemented an extensive approach, concentrating on sites and settlements and outgrowth of earlier topographical studies. MME offered little archeological information on the medieval period, but it provided a historical perspective on the economy and settlement of the area in early modern times that was based on Venetian documents, the work of Peter Topping. So this was an important milestone. It established the diachronic model which subsequent regional surveys adopted. After MME, regional surveys proliferated in Greece, especially in central, southern Greece, and some of the Aegean islands. So here I have three seminal publications, an island polity, the archaeology of exploitation in Milos, then a Greek countryside, the work of the Southern Argolid Exploration Project, and then landscape archaeology as long-term history, which was the work at Northern Chaos, which happened a bit later in the 1980s. Regional surveys in Greece gradually expanded their approach to look beyond settlements or the hot spots termed sites and consider a more comprehensive distribution of human trains, traces on the landscape. So these would include more diffuse remains ranging from small concentrations of archeological materials to ephemeral traces such as scatters of individual artifacts. So these surveys recorded sites as well as scatters of artifacts occurring off-site, and these are known as intensive. So the impact of this approach to the study of the medieval and later eras came in the 1980s and the 1990s, when large-scale intensive surveys were undertaken in several areas of Greece, including the Peloponnesus, the Southern Argolid, Nemea, Laconia, Berbatilimnes, Methana, Pylos, Asea, Eastern Corinthia, Corinthia, more recently the Western Argolid project, then in Central Greece, the long-running Biosha regional survey, uh, some, some, some surveys on Crete, such as Fakia and Vrokastro, and some of the islands, especially Milos, Chaos, and Kithira. So the new wave of intensive surveys produced a rich diachronic record of the rural landscape that could address questions of landscape stability and change. Overall, a significant portion of the work in the 1980s, 90s, and the early 2000s focused on methods and research design, especially site definition and collection strategies. So basic questions became the focus of intense debate. What do the artifact concentrate identified by surveys represent? How is a site defined? How can it be distinguished from off-site material? In general, intensive surveys have defined sites as anomalous and distinct peaks in overall density distributions. Sites represent rural habitation, but the question is whether some of the smaller sites represent permanent farmsteads or seasonally occupied field houses. And the distinction between the two is often difficult to make. Furthermore, low densities of pottery scattered across the countryside have been attributed to a variety of activities, including manuring, non-habitation activity areas, plowing, as well as geomorphological processes. And as landscape archeology span continues to develop, 
Over time, the intensity of coverage has shifted from the site to the artifact. So this shift from a site-based approach to a siteless survey has the potential to achieve a more nuanced history of the landscape and more recent projects such as the Eastern Corinthia or the Western Argoli have implemented this approach. So the concern with methodological issues means that less attention has been directed to interpretation. And as I already mentioned, landscape archeology span grew out of processual studies, culture studied as a process, and these are settlement archeology span and human ecology, which emphasize the physical features, land use, and ecological limitations of environments. So the great advantage of this framework is that it offered the tools to investigate the material record of all social groups, including the historically invisible, the rural population that earlier elite-centered archeological research had neglected. So in general, the processual intellectual tradition has defined the analytical framework of landscape archeology. span and as a result, the interpretations are predominantly economic. So the recognition of dispersed and nucleated settlement patterns and their meaning has been the main topic. These settlement shifts probably reflect phases of economic expansion and contraction, different agricultural strategies and population fluctuations. Dispersed patterns of settlement point to small holdings, intensive forms of agriculture, and periods of economic expansion. In contrast, nucleated patterns represent control of the land by an elite or the imposition of control by an external power. So this binary opposition of dispersed and nucleated patterns has placed emphasis on uniformity of interpretation at the expense of regional diversity. Another significant issue wrote about by the growth of landscape archeology span projects is the recognition of pottery rich and pottery poor periods. So the supply and consumption of pottery fluctuates significantly in different chronological periods and has implications for the visibility or invisibility of particular periods. So lack of readily identifiable material from certain periods such as the 7th to the 10th century CE often leads to inferences about the population or abandonment of the region. So our knowledge of these dark ages in terms of ceramics is gradually improving as more effort is invested in deposits that can provide the missing sequences. Still, factors related to high or low ceramic visibility are a significant factor that may affect interpretation. So the availability of high quality data from several regions has opened up new opportunities for the study of periods that are very visible archeologically, such as the 12th and the 13th century CE. So ceramics of this period are plentiful and highly diagnostic. So many regional surveys have identified remnants of settlement and ceramics that date to this period. Beotia, Laconia, Nemea, and here I have some of the material that comes from site 600 that I will discuss a bit more later. So the regional patterns may differ, but the picture is clear. There is a proliferation of sites and off-site material, which must reflect dense habitation, as well as the intense level of agricultural activity during this period. So clearly, these rural communities had access to the markets where a wide variety of ceramic containers were available. Glazed tablewares were probably more costly compared to simple utilitarian wares. Nevertheless, they are present in the rural sites that archeological surveys have recorded. They're found in greater numbers at urban sites such as Corinth based on the published material from the excavations. Still, they're common in artifact scatters at rural sites. Although we have used glazed pottery primarily as a chronological market, marker, it is important to consider consumer preferences. 
that are reflected in these assemblages, as well as the changes in the ceramic industry and the organization of ceramic production. So we have sufficient information to understand major trends, especially a change in ceramic production from centralized to dispersed. So from the 9th to the early 11th centuries, white glaze wares, a Constantinopolitan product, monopolized the market. They're mostly found in urban centers, and few of them have been found at rural sites. So here we have material from Laconia, from the excavations at Sparta, that Pamela Armstrong published. We have the classic study uh, from the excavations at Sarachani in Istanbul by John Hayes. And then we have some of the plates from uh, Charles Morgan, a classic study of the Byzantine potter. Now, for the growing number of shipwrecks also document the established trade networks and transport of ceramics. So for example, the Pelagonisos shipwreck, which is number four on this map and dates to about the mid 12th century, was loaded with fine scarfido and shows that ceramics traveled some distance before reaching the market. The available archeological evidence suggests that glazed pottery in the middle and late Byzantine period was produced in regional workshops located in urban as well as rural areas. There are several well-documented workshops in Corinth, Vivimotijo, Ceres, Thessaloniki, Halkis, and Cyprus. And there are additional ceramic workshops that have been identified in recent years. So these workshops have yielded wasters or kiln stacking artifacts, which provide clear evidence for local pottery production of glazed wares. So the Thessaloniki metro excavations, especially the Venizelu station excavations, along with the salvage excavation in Halkiviki at Yerisos, have produced kiln rods and stacking devices that date to the 11th century. And these come from a recent study by Constantinos Raptis. So we see a reconstruction of how they would have been used in the kiln. They would uh, be inserted in the walls of the kiln to create shelving for the glaze wares. And then the S-shaped devices would be used to suspend items from these rods. So to maximize the packing of the kiln and the use of space. We also have a site in the Nemea region, which clearly provided evidence for a local pottery workshop. It has similar remains, and that uh, clearly shows us that glazed pottery was also made in the region that we have surveyed. So this is a map. I will show you this map later in high resolution, but there are these two sites, 510 and 509, and it is site 510 that produced these artifacts that are kiln stacking artifacts. Then at site 509, we have installations related to agricultural processing like this olive crushing basin. And there is a chapel of Agia Kiriaki, I'm sorry, too, uh, too early. And Agia Kiriaki, before it got remodeled, had an opus sectile uh, floor. So maybe we have a small monastic estate there, but it's hard to tell. So we have these kiln stacking devices, and here is a photograph of them. They are similar, identical, like the ones that have been recorded in other parts of Greece. Uh, originally, this technology came from Islamic workshops. Now, the pottery that we have from that site um, provides a range of dates from the late 11th to the late 13th century. So we have some of the earlier, which is the early sleep painted, but then we have a number of styles that date to the 13th century. Um, so this change in ceramic production with workshops that were established in both urban and rural areas contributes greatly, greatly to the busy countryside that we see in the 12th and especially the 13th centuries. And as our knowledge of production site improves, it will be possible to document the distribution and movement of ceramics 
and the information they can provide about trade networks. So as a case study, I will present an overview of the results of the Nemea Valley archeological project. And this is a project that was organized by James Wright, as well as Jack Davis and John Cherry. So NVAP, as we call it, documented a proliferation of habitation sites and agricultural activity that dates to the period of the 12th and the 13th centuries. So this is the location of Nemea, this is the outline of the survey area, and this is a map that shows the sites that primarily produce medieval material. I will talk about the sites that are in the vicinity of the sanctuary of Zeus, but also there is a large site, the classical city of Lius, that produce some medieval material, but primarily I will concentrate at site 600. So overall, the survey recorded two large sites, 600 and 704, and a substantial number of small sites located on the lower slopes of the hills surrounding the Nemea Valley and in smaller valleys in the southern part of the area. And the smaller sites vary in size, usually they cover less than a hectare. Now, the two large sites, site 600 and then 704, consist of dense scatters of ceramics that are spread over several fields. So site 600 covers an area of approximately 34 hectares. Site 704 has an estimated size of 47 hectares. And both are located in the same general area, site 600 to the east of the sanctuary of Zeus and the classical stadium. And site 704, on the Tritos Pass just outside the Nemea Valley. So at site 600, the highest densities of medieval material occur around the spring that is known locally as the medieval or Turkish fountain, which we see depicted here. And both of these sites consist of large scatters of dense and highly diagnostic ceramics, and most likely represent remnants of villages established near good agricultural land. So site 600 was partly built on hilly ground and most likely was a nucleated settlement, a horil, a village. And what we see here is an aerial photograph of the area. This is the sanctuary of Zeus. This is the classical stadium. This is the location of the fountain. And site 600 spreads over this area and practically encompasses the fields that are very close to the stadium. And we'll come back to that later. So in addition to the survey material, we have the excavations at the sanctuary of Zeus. And these have produced plentiful evidence of farming activities that date to the 12th and the 13th centuries in the form of extensive farming plots and an irrigation ditch. So this map tries to capture all this activity by showing the location of farming plots, other farming features, pits, structures that are few, and also graves that are around the basilica, the early Christian basilica, which is hidden here below L18 and L19. <clears throat> now, a few domestic structures were identified. And there was one domestic structure that was excavated in 1976. It is located at L14. There was another one in this square, but it's not published. So this two-room structure was excavated in the southern side of the Temple of Zeus. And it had a stone and cement paving and two very well constructed cisterns. It was built of blocks from the Temple of Zeus, which were set at intervals with smaller stones in between. And the excavator, Stephen Miller, concluded that ceramic material found in the western cistern and beneath the floor indicates both a construction date and a filling date within the 13th century CE. And a similar house was excavated immediately, immediately west of the Nemea River and had similar features, storage, pithy, and cisterns. Furthermore, there is a series of trash pits 
and these were uncovered during the excavations um, near the early Christian Basilica, um, as well as the Nemea Stadium. Now, the medieval community that resided in the area had built a chapel over the remains of the Basilica, and this appears as a mound in an early 19th century view of the Sanctuary of Zeus, so where the red arrow is. Unfortunately, the French archaeologists who initiated archaeological investigations in the area, and that was in 1884, removed its remains without recording them. So the area was excavated in the 1980s under the auspices of the University of California, Berkeley. And the excavations revealed that the tile pavement of the early Christian Basilica was covered over by medieval layers. And the study of the stratigraphy and the finds shows that this area served primarily for burials as well as trash pits and domestic refuge. For example, a pit that is located in Reed Square L18 contained a large amount of well-preserved medieval pottery, both coarse wares and diagnostic glazed wares. And these include fragments of uh, incised graffito of the mid 13th century, green and brown painted ware of the late 12th, early 13th century, and a wide variety of amphorae and cooking pots. And from the excavations of the stadium, we have a series of medieval trash pits, and these were located in the north end of the stadium and contained large quantities of ceramics and coins that date to the 12th and 13th centuries. So we see an aerial photo during excavation of the stadium. So these uh, pits, these trash pits were located in the northern section. So in an earlier um, image of the stadium, these would be um, the squares that uh, produce great amounts of medieval pottery and they were closed deposits. So we have EE25 and then FF23 that is depicted here. So I'll show you some of the material rapidly that has come out of FF23. And this is the material that I'm now working towards publishing it. So we have a great amount of glazed pottery from these pits. We have a variety of scraffito. We have one piece of polychrome ware. This is the only one we have identified in the deposits. We have champlevé, we have missiles, green and brown three wares, and then a wide variety of coarse wares. And these represent vessels that were used in daily household tasks, pitchers, basins, amphora, flasks, jugs, containers for storage, food preparation, cooking, serving of food and wine. And I will show you several slides of them, but fairly rapidly without spending too much time. So here we see these vessels as representative of functional categories, and we follow the uh, kind of functional grouping that Bakugis has suggested. So we have an amphora, which would be a magaricon in the Byzantine terminology. We have smaller um, kind of amphorae, and that would be a lagina or a laginion. We have pitchers, and uh, they're both glazed and unglazed. We have um, items that are fairly common in the Nemea area. These are flasks, ascodavla. And here we see an example from the Museum, the Museum of Thieves. So these come with uh, flat bottoms that are decorated. Um, and uh, they are used to carry water or other liquid foods to the fields. You could carry them on, on the side of an animal. So they're clearly associated with agricultural activities and it makes sense in a place such as Nemea. We also have kind of a unique item. This is a tube of a siphon, sifuni. This is the actual artifact, it is hollow. And uh, it has a very good parallel in the Museum of Monembasia, and we see how it would be attached to a vessel. And then this would be a vessel, a sifuni, that would be used to draw wine 
those actions out of epiphanes. And that would be without disturbing the wine. And that would be with the help of a reed. And in fact, we also have even the, um, uh, the cover with a central opening of the pithos that we see right here. And one comes from the survey, from, from the excavations, and the other comes from the survey. So these are artifacts that really make a lot of sense in the context of Nemea, which was always a wine producing area. We have chafing dishes, and this one comes from um, the Byzantine Museum in Athens, but Guy Sanders has documented many in Corinth. And we have a wide variety of cooking pots. These with the vertical reeds that we see here in the 3D model are very common in a map, but we have a wide variety and they come in different sizes. Some are small, like a diameter of 11 centimeters, and some are quite large, double the size. We also have um, <clears throat> pithy, um, and these would be artifacts used for containers used for um, food storage and similar purposes. And we also have tubs and basins. And uh, these are again, have very good parallels in Corinth. This is from the publication um, of, of material, of course, wares from Corinth by McKay. And these are basins that are very well preserved. And all of that was in these um, trash pits uh, in the stadium. So, um, the community at Site 600 that the Nemea Valley Archaeological Survey identified was probably responsible for this series of trash pits that were uncovered during the excavations of the Nemea Stadium and the area near the Basilica. And the ongoing analysis of this material will help us reconstruct the patterns of land use and trash disposal, which probably contributed to the ceramic scatters that were documented by the Nemea Valley Archaeological Survey. So the question is, how do the patterns recorded by archaeological surveys, such as ENVAP, fit with existing textual interpretations? Several historians have suggested that the 11th, and in particular the 12th centuries, were a time of unprecedented economic and demographic growth for Byzantium. So this growth encompassed the urban centers and the countryside and coincided with the growth of large estates. So in the past, historians connected feudalization and the growth of large estates with the destruction of the free peasant communities and eventually the downfall of Byzantium. That was the classic view by Ostrogorsky, for example. Now the current picture suggests that the reorganization of agricultural production represented by the growth of the large estate, was a stimulus that contributed to economic and demographic growth beginning in the 11th century. Textual sources available for a few regions present a picture of economic growth and population increase. For example, fiscal documents for Macedonia in Northern Greece indicate that the population growth was dramatic from the early 12th to the early 14th century. Furthermore, the intensification of agricultural production and the proliferation of ceramics and supplements in the rural landscape reflect the political developments of the 11th century and trade expansion. So Western Europe was entering a period of expansion evident in the growing power of the Italian maritime cities, Venice, Genoa, and Pisa. And in 1082, the Venetians were granted exemptions from Byzantine trade taxes. Venetian commercial expansion grew steadily in the Byzantine territories. So similar exemptions and privileges were soon granted to Genoa and Pisa. So the Italian traders became very active during the 12th century and their commercial activities led to an increased volume of exchange that included luxury goods such as silk, as well as foodstuffs and agricultural products. For example, the city of Corinth was one of the main Peloponnesian centers that, involved, that were involved in interregional trade. So the Venetians exported large quantities of 
olive oil from Corinth. Increased demand for produce coincided with the intensification of agricultural production. And over time, trade dominated by the Italian city-states brought Greece and the Eastern Mediterranean region in close contact with Western European markets. So soon the Crusades brought a dramatic transformation in the interaction between East and West. The turning point was the Fourth Crusade, which under Venetian leadership resulted in the capture of Constantinople in 1204. So the Latin capture of the city and the breakdown of the centralized Byzantine state led to political fragmentation. Several smaller political units replaced Byzantium. And in the Peloponnesus, the principality of Achaia or Morea, which was established by the Western Knights, became the most stable and successful political unit. It blended Western feudal customs with local traditions. And Byzantine efforts to reconquer the Peloponnesus in the 13th and 14th centuries led to continuing competition and warfare. And in the mid 14th century, Byzantine territories in the Peloponnesus were brought together and formed the Despotate of the Morea, a successful polity that lasted until 1460 when the Ottoman Turks conquered it. So the political and social structure of medieval Greece became extremely fragmented and decentralized after the Latin conquest of 1204. So the expectation is that the conditions of political decentralization and increasing regional conflict influenced rural habitation and agricultural activity. Archaeological finds, especially pottery of the 12th and the 13th centuries, are very common in the countryside. In some urban contexts, there is a change in the material culture 50 years later after the Latin conquest. So the excavations of Corinth have established that local ceramic production declined in the last quarter of the 13th century, while Italian imports such as Proto Maiolica and Veneto ware increased and eventually dominated the Corinthian market. Along with new styles of decoration, such as the Proto Maiolica plates that we see from Morgan's volume, there were changes in form, especially in cooking wares, possibly indicating a change in diet and or dining habits associated with the presence of Westerners in Corinth. However, as Tim Gregory suggests, the correlation between new cuisine, dining habits, and stylistic change in the Corinthian cooking pots is rather weak. Furthermore, it is clear that the mid to late 13th century cooking pots were also a local Corinthian product, not an import. So the reasons behind the appearance of this new form of cooking pot defy common explanations. They may reflect changes in ceramic fashion and availability resulting from the establishment of new workshops and the development of new products. So the change in the ceramic industry of Corinth is well documented. Similar changes have been observed in the ceramics from the excavations of the Byzantine fortress at Isthmia, which is close to Corinth. Beyond these sites, it is unclear how widespread this pattern was, especially in rural areas. So for example, in the region of Nemea, Italian glazed wares are very few. And typically, they are associated with sites that were under Latin control. And now we'll talk about uh, one of them in just a minute. So, Unlike changes in ceramics, shifts in settlement are far more widespread. So we have a nucleated fortified pattern of settlement that takes place in Southern Greece towards the end of the 13th century. And in the area of Nemea, archeological evidence of settlement and agricultural activity becomes scarce at that time. So we have the site of Polyfengi, which have been identified in historical sources as such, which really dominates the region. And the steep hill control the passes to the south and the west. And its summit is fortified by a wall and a square tower. And then the ruins of a village spread over a sloping plateau 
below the summit. So um, I have tried to show all these different sites uh, that are clustering uh, on Porifengi. So the fort at the top, then the settlement, and then um, the sloping terraces that also produce quite a bit of pottery, a monastery, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the next um, very interesting site is the Zorok Shelter, which has its own site number, 901. And it is on the south side of the hill. It is at the same level as the settlement. And it is a 45K chapel that has a partially preserved wall painting that depicts the presentation in the temple. And it looks like a fort, and it was used as a fort during the Greek War of Independence. And this is the plan of the actual rock shelter. The wall would have covered most of the opening when it was still intact. So diagnostic pottery from the settlement and the lower slopes of Porifegi includes Italian imports, Proto Maiolica, Italian painted Scarfito, Maiolica, and these range in date from the late 13th to the 15th century. And we have a few more from the site of views that I mentioned earlier, but that's all that we have in terms of Western imported pottery in the region that we've examined. Then there is the monastery that dominates the uh, landscape in Neanemea. It's uh, Panagia to Vrahu in Neanemea. And there are several sources that provide information about Olifengi and its ecclesiastical history. And the earlier reference to the Church of the Virgin of the Rock, Panagia to Vrahu, dates to 1402. Now, recent excavations and restoration work that was undertaken by the effort of antiquities in Corinth, when Dimitris Athanasoulis was the effort there, have revealed previously unknown building phases that date back to the early Byzantine period. So the church itself was built in the 13th century and has successive layers of wall paintings that date to the late and the post-Byzantine periods. So the growth of Polyfengi and similar sites mark a drastic change in settlement, which reflects the extreme fragmentation of the social and political structure as Latin control was consolidated and new regimes of land management were established. According to Jacobi, the agrarian infrastructure of the countryside was not seriously affected by the fragmentation and redistribution of large estates in Frankish and Venetian territories soon after the conquest. So the earliest partitions of property and peasants were based on the consultation of Byzantine fiscal registers and oral testimony. And the new Latin lords, as well as the peasantry, had a vested interest in continuity and a smooth transition from the Byzantine to the new regime. So the integration of Greek elites at various levels of the Frankish and Venetian administrations ensured continuity in land use practices. Now the drastic change in settlement in the late 13th century reflects Western norms as well as prevailing conditions of endemic warfare and incursions. So the late medieval period was a time of political fragmentation, continuous competition and conflict. So defense and security played an important role in the choice and location of settlement. Many settlements developed around pre-existing or newly established castra that provided relative security from frequent aids. So in the Nemea region, the pattern of settlement in the late 13th to the 15th centuries provides a stark contrast to habitation during the 12th to the late 13th centuries. Similar settlement trends have been documented in other parts of the northeastern Peloponnesus, as fortified villages grew around castles or towers, such as Aios Vasilios or Aionori and Agelonkas, so a bit further. And there are numerous examples in other regions of the Peloponnesus, the best known site being Mistras, which became the refuge of the Byzantine aristocracy and the capital of the despotate of the Morea. Now, 
late medieval fortified villages share a number of common characteristics. They're built on inaccessible hilltops with commanding views around a keep, a small fortified area, which contains a tower and often a cistern. And usually the village extends below the keep with freestanding houses that are built along parallel contour lines. So the settlements vary in size and they range from 15 to 300 houses. So here we have a couple of examples. All these features that I mentioned are evident in the late medieval fortified settlement at Panakton in central Greece. The village was inhabited for less than a century from the middle of the 14th to the early 15th century. It consisted of at least 30 houses that were built on a series of terraces covering an area of approximately a hectare. The community was built around a tower stronghold and the site of Polyfengi in the Nemea region is comparable to Panacton in terms of layout and size. And there are, there are many similar communities that have been recorded, especially by the Molina project. So here is an example um, in Ajaia, Castro Castelli, this is south of Calabrita, that has similar characteristics, and that is part of the work of Costis Curelis. So the conditions of the late medieval period led to the concentration of the population in nucleated fortified settlements. Besides offering security, hilltop sites served other functions. They were important for the collection of taxes and reflect increased control of local populations. They also played a role in the creation and reproduction of relations of power. So the creation of Castra was an effort to reinforce territorial and political control through the consolidation of lands and the aggregation of people. So in the Peloponnesus, the nucleation of settlement was a response to conditions of insecurity, conflict and warfare, which increased in the late 13th century and intensified in the 14th and 15th centuries. So these fortified settlements served as central points in the efforts of competing powers to establish territorial control. So, so far I have presented an overview of the wealth of information that we have recovered about medieval habitation and remains. Landscape archeology span projects have also made significant contributions to the post-medieval period following the Ottoman conquest. So it was in this context of intensive regional projects that archeologists span started to appreciate the rich textual and material legacy of more recent times, such as the Venetian and Ottoman eras. Example, <clears throat> in one of the publications of the Kia survey, a leading practitioner of landscape archaeology, Jack Davis, wrote, why have so few remains of the Frankish and Ottoman periods been recovered in surveys in the Cyclades? And why are their distributions outside major settlements so limited? Few archaeologists have succeeded in integrating the rich historical data at their disposal with the material evidence that has typically been collected by archeological surveys. So some projects have paid serious attention to the integration of historical records and material remains. So the Biosche Regional Survey in Central Greece stands out for investing considerable effort in the analysis of unpublished documents from the Ottoman archives. So Makhil Hill has been able to extract a great deal of information from the Ottoman tax registers, including a complete breakdown of villages and towns in the region of the Biosia, as well as crop production by variety and yields, industrial production, and detailed demographic data. So the growth of the region in the late 15th and throughout the 16th centuries, recorded in the Ottoman registers, can be tied in with a flourishing settlement picture documented by the Biosha survey. And here I'm borrowing a map from the work of Thanasis Ionis that was published in 2016. So in central Greece, archeological data and Ottoman tax registers 
have provided information on cycles of growth and abandonment of rural settlement and demographic trends from the 15th to the 19th centuries. And John Lindcliffe and especially Anasis Vionis have made great contributions to the archeology span of the Ottoman era in central Greece, integrating the economic, demographic, settlement and ceramic data. In the Peloponnesus, we have the Pilos Regional Archaeological Project that also invested in the study of primary sources of the Venetian and Ottoman eras. Has made full use of Venetian and Ottoman sources, travelers' accounts, maps, and place name studies, testimony of local informants, and the results of intensive archaeological fieldwork. So these efforts resulted in a series of journal publications, as well as a monograph and an edited volume that were co-authored by historians and archaeologists, which have set high standards for the integrated study of these periods. So the Ottoman Cadastral Survey of the province of Anavarin, contemporary Navarino, is the focus of a monograph. So the Cadastral Survey dates to 1716, a year after the Ottoman reconquest of the, of the Morea from the Venetians. So the authors provide an overview of Ottoman tax and land management practices and reconstruct in great detail the agricultural and settlement systems of the region using multiple sources, Ottoman, Venetian, French, as well as archeological and topographic research. So overall, this study offers a richly documented regional history that touches upon larger issues of social and economic history of the Morea in the 18th century. Furthermore, it integrates written and material sources remarkably well and demonstrates how archeological evidence can be employed to improve our understanding of archival documents. Now, I already discussed the work in Nemea and the success of the Nemea Valley Archaeological Project to document widespread habitation during the medieval era. However, the survey has identified few archaeological remains of the post-medieval era. So from the 15th century on, <clears throat> the main settlements in the region are the same ones that continue today, such as Aios Georgios, which is near Nemea today, Kutsi, Kutsomavi, then Archea Nemea, also known as Irakli. So we are fortunate to have two studies that are based on Ottoman and Venetian records, and these provide further information about the region of Nemea. So Panahi has provided detailed information from the Ottoman census and tax registers for the district of Nemea, which again was known as Agios Georgios at the time. The first register for the Peloponnesus was compiled in 1461, a few years after the Ottoman conquest. Fortunately, there is no information about the district of Agios Georgios in this document because a portion of the, of the volume has been lost. So the earliest information that we have for this district derived from the register of 1512. Furthermore, Panahi has examined Ottoman registers that date to the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. A, a considerable number of villages and hamlets are mentioned in these documents, but he focuses on four settlements, those which are most important and give us the fullest information. So Agios Georgios, contemporary Neanimea, Kutsomadi, Kutsi, these are settlements that continue to be inhabited today. And after a major earthquake in 1867, the village of Kutsomadi was rebuilt in the vicinity of the original location. Now the fourth settlement, Lekosi, has been abandoned and it's only known as a place name. So the Ottoman documents provide information about the type of land holdings, the number of tax taxable households, the names of taxpayers and their religion, and sometimes the ethnicity of the inhabitants. For example, in the registers of the early Ottoman period, the village of Kutsi is referred to as Kutsi of the Albanians. So the documents also list cultivated crops, 
quantities produced and the taxes relating to each kind of produce. And apart from agricultural production, the registers mention other economic activities, such as beekeeping and silk production, as well as the number and types of meals and the products that were milled. So the Ottoman documents enable us to follow population changes over time. There was rapid population growth in the 16th century, followed by severe contraction in the 17th century, then recovery in the 18th century. And additional information is provided by the Venetian census of 1700 when the Venetians conquered uh, the Peloponnesus. And these documents also point to demographic contraction. Now, the archaeological surveys that have been conducted in the region of Corinthia, the Nemea Valley Archaeological Project, the surveys in the valleys of Lius and the region of Sikion, as well as the Eastern Corinthia Archaeological Survey, they have produced little evidence about habitation in the Ottoman period that is based on material remains or identifiable ceramics. So for example, there is this walled enclosure. This is near the site of Lius. And we have a testimony from William Leake that maybe a chief lake was located there below the hill of the Acropolis. So to improve the current picture, the Ottoman registers that were studied by Panaki could provide guidance for further archeological and topographical research. Clearly the systematic study of Ottoman tax registers has the potential to offer a wealth of demographic and economic information, which in conjunction with the archeological data collected by regional field surveys can provide a model for interdisciplinary regional investigation. The goal of this overview is to demonstrate that landscape archaeology, a relatively new form of archaeological fieldwork, has grown rapidly in the last 40 years. As the field matures, it has become more diverse methodologically as well as theoretically. The fundamentals of establishing chronology and economic reconstruction continue to be important. However, less tangible aspects are also being addressed. The landscape is not only viewed as a set of resources, but also as a system that is imbued with cultural meaning. So in the last two decades, the field of landscape archeology span has expanded its scope to incorporate postmodern approaches, which emphasize the active role of material culture in the construction of social relations, the symbolic role of architecture the meaning of places and the human components of space. So these underline the limitations of the earlier paradigm, the environmental functionalist settlement pattern studies that focused on demographic and economic reconstruction pretty much exclusively. So material culture plays multiple roles in the social, political, and ideational domains. Settlement locations domestic and ecclesiastical architecture, fortifications, ceramic distributions, agricultural terraces, were all part of the historical landscape that was socially constructed and meaningful to the groups that inhabited it. For example, pottery, the most common find of landscape archeology span projects, is an effective dating tool. Ceramics are also an important source of everyday practices, food consumption, and social display, areas that are growing but are still kind of underexplored. So the same is the case for site and settlement locations and the built environment, which reflect political, social, and cultural decisions. So the recent emphasis on sacred landscapes exemplifies this effort to take into account religious ideology in the organization of space. So overall, the multidisciplinary perspectives of landscape archaeology projects have made vital contributions to the study of many periods and the processes of settlement growth and abandonment. They have also offered a better understanding of the medieval, post-medieval, and early modern periods and the significant historical change 
and transformation that characterizes this era. Now, it is within this period that national identities and movements were formed, leading to the independence of Greece and other Balkan countries. And in turn, it was the national narrative of liberated Greece that turned its attention to periods of national glory and the study of classical monuments. As a result, the study of its recent past did not receive sufficient attention. Finally, it seems that we have come to a point where these constraints no longer apply. And a historical archaeology of medieval, post-medieval, and early modern Greece and the broader region, the Eastern Mediterranean, is indeed possible. Landscape archaeology projects with their interdisciplinary approach have opened new paths and provided a model of how such a challenging task may be accomplished. So this is my favorite picture of the Sanctuary of Zeus um, as it appeared in the late 1980s. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Effie. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and overview of the uh, archaeology of medieval Byzantium, especially in the countryside, the countryside of, of, of the Byzantine provinces and also the post-Byzantine Ottoman uh, era. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there is a lot to discuss. I just wanted to thank you for two things. <laughs> One is for stressing the uh, uh, the fact that you know pottery shapes do not always go with changing dining habits, as you uh, showed in the case of cooking pots and the shape of Byzantine and Frankish cooking pots from Corinth, and also for actually um, you know stressing the importance of post-medieval archaeology, also in the case of the area you have been working on, um, and all these important conclusions that you drew by combining both. The archaeology and the textual sources in, in all periods that you yeah, that you talked about. Um, I, I will not say much. Uh, it is already uh, quarter to nine, so I would like to give uh, the chance to our online audience to perhaps comment or uh, uh, ask questions uh, about things that you uh, already talked about uh, or other things that they would like you to elaborate on. Um, there are no uh, questions so far in our chat, uh, apart from some congratulating messages, but I wanted to invite everyone who wants to, uh, to switch on their cameras um, uh, and perhaps uh, unmute the microphone if, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment. Uh, I would like to, to pose the first question, Effie, if, if I may, uh, so that I give some time to other people to perhaps um, uh, type in their questions. Um, as I have been working, as, as you have in other parts of Greece, on the on the ceramics, on the ceramic assemblages of villages and other settlement sites across the countryside, I, I come to realize that uh, the the, uh, uh, the the amount of of uh, you know diagnostic pottery actually diminishes after the middle of the 13th century. You know, this the, after the first uh, decades of the Frankish, of the Latin domination. Do you, have you accounted such a phenomenon in uh, the assemblages from your sites in Nemea? Uh, I mean, beyond the 12th, early 13th century, what happens with glazed decorated pottery? Um, some of the styles that I also shared and using the revised chronology that Guy has developed for Corinth seem to be going until the late 13th century. But then it seems like there is no glazed pottery or people are not using the same trash disposal patterns that you know, makes this pottery visible in the fields. Um, or maybe uh, really farming is not, is changing basically the new kind of land regimes that start after the, uh, Latin conquest um, somehow have their impact. But again, the settlement, as well as the record that we have of ceramics, um, kind of drops off. And then we have, you know, these complex of sites that are presented, which is the only place that has produced 
Western pottery for us. So I don't have a good explanation. And I think always the, um, the changes in the ceramic industry are important. We're starting to understand them, but not fully. So I don't know what happens with the production of glazed pottery in that time, in late 13th century, whether it continues, you know, in, in these original workshops, it seems that the one that we have at site 510 probably drops out. Um, so I don't have a good explanation, but I can definitely see a pattern. Um, and it's the same pattern that you described. Okay. And then in the 14th and 15th centuries, you, you uh, uh, explained that sediment tends to be nucleated around or actually behind uh, the defensive walls of, uh, in the countryside of, of, a, of, a castle, of, a, of a castle, of a defended settlement. Um, is there no evidence for, or what kind of evidence is there outside the defensive walls of such uh, settlement sites? In terms of habitation, that, that, um, the undefended settlements and moves into uh, Castra, or what happens? For the area that we have surveyed, it seems that the only other place that produces pottery that is contemporaneous with Polyphengi are some tracts, are some fields, uh, very close to the site of Lius, not on the Acropolis itself, but rather very close to the valley. And um, they are the only area that seem to be using pottery of this type, imported pottery. Um, we don't have it from anywhere else, even from the sanctuary of Zeus, where we have excavated material, we don't have any Western imports. So um, this is the pattern that we can document. What does it mean about the settlement? Again, it seems that several of the surveys, uh, including Sikionia, including the Eastern Corinthia project, are just not finding uh, archeological evidence like you do in Viotia. So that's why you know, what you have done in Viotia is so instructive and so important for the rest of us that, you know, we're trying to see the ceramic styles. We're trying to see, you know, the architectural evidence that you have, but we don't have it. Um, I talked about Lekosi, which we know that was occupied uh, based on the Ottoman defters, uh, on the information that Panahi published. We know where it is located based on um, speaking to locals. You know, they show us where Lekosi, the area of Lekosi is. But there isn't anything comparable. There isn't any settlement evidence that we have been able to identify. Um, there were some uh, Byzantine remains, maybe a little Byzantine chapel, but you know nothing com compared to what you have been able to do in Viotia. So it's kind of a, that's where we are. Yeah, that in itself is interesting. I mean, the the the, uh, the local histories of different places which are not too far from each other. Um, uh, you, you mentioned also the, uh, the fact that you have a few Western imports during the period of uh, Latin domination. Uh, and, and, and that in itself is also important. I was thinking, I mean, you have identified uh, the traces of what must have been uh, a pottery workshop in the 12th century, right? In, that was in Polyfengi. Uh, if, no, no, the, the pottery workshop is in the southern part of the survey. And the earliest evidence that we have based on the pottery, it's late 11th. It's the early slip painted. Um, um, but then it continues until the late 13th, again, based on the pottery. But um, then that's, that's it. You know, we don't, have, we don't have any other material. But just the fact that we do have a pottery workshop in the middle of nowhere, uh, mm -hmm. that is exciting by itself. Um, Absolutely, yeah, yeah. A pottery workshop in a rural area that early is, is amazing. And that is what is interesting. I mean, you also mentioned uh, 